Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 8 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 12 CC Lesson 3 on the strength of a linear fit. So in the last two lessons we've been looking at lines of best fit on scatter plots, right? And sometimes lines of best fit fit the data better than others. And that's what we're really talking about when we talk about the strength of the linear fit. So let's get right into it right away with the first exercise. We oftentimes fit a line to a set of data. How well the line fits is known as its strength of fit. Now this can really be thought of in terms of how close the data points, how close or far, sorry, the data points lie from the line of best fit. Okay, so I mean if they lie really close to the line of best fit, it's very strong. And if they're way away from the line of best fit, then yeah, it's weaker. So let's get into that in the first exercise. Exercise number one. A study was done to see the relationship between the height of adult men and their weight. A sample of 100 men between the ages of 20 and 60 had their height and weight measures with the results shown in the scatter plot below. How about their height and weight measured with their sc the scatter plot shown below? I like that better. Their height and weight measured with the results shown on the scatter plot below. Letter A. The slope of the line of best fit shown is 3.8. Give an interpretation of what this means in the context of the problem. All right, so we did some of this interpretation of slopes and y-intercepts of lines of best fit in the last lesson. Let's see what you can do with this slope of 3.8. Pause the video now and see what you can tell me. All right, well remember, the slope of any line will always have units of the y units per x units. Now it's really the change in the y units per change in the x units. So really it's 3.8 pounds right per inch. Right? Now what does that tell you? Well what it tells you is that for every extra inch of height of a person you have an extra 3.8 pounds of weight. So for every extra inch of height, a male will weigh an extra 3.8 pounds. Sorry, that kind of drifted a little bit into my, my scatter plot. For every extra inch of height, a male will weigh an extra 3.8 pounds. You could say for every inch in height of increase, or every increase of an inch in height, we have an increase of 3.8 pounds in weight, right? But it's always a change in blank gives us a change in blank. All right. Now, for what really the topic of the day is, letter B. How would you rate the strength of this linear fit of the data? Circle. Would you say that there's none? Would you say that it's weak, moderate, or strong? What do you think? There's really almost no wrong answer on this one because we're going to be talking about this obviously for the rest of the lesson, but what is your gut instinct if I asked none, weak, moderate, or strong in terms of the fit? Pause the video now. All right, well, I would rate this as a moderate fit, okay? Now, the, the reason I would do that, it would either be rated as a moderate or a weak. None would literally mean, you know, you couldn't really draw a line of best fit with any confidence through this data, right? You wouldn't know whether the line of best fit should have a positive slope or a negative slope, none of that. That's none. A strong relationship would mean that the data points are almost right on the line. Like, like they're, maybe, maybe they're not right on the line. It's not like a perfect fit. That's the difference between a strong and a perfect, but they, they'd be pretty darn close to the line. Now, the difference between a weak fit and a moderate fit, that's kind of tough. You know, you'd have to really have some multiple examples of different scatter plots to basically compare between a moderate and a weak. But I would call this moderate simply because there is generally a definite trend that the taller that men get, the more that they weigh. 
And of course, there's exceptions to these rules, right? You can have shorter men that weigh more and taller men that weigh less. But generally speaking, it's pretty obvious that as men get taller, right, their weight goes up. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of comparison. Right? In Algebra 1, you're going to learn how to use what's called the linear correlation coefficient to measure the strength of a linear fit. All right? And it'll be great because it'll just be this one number, very similar to a percentage actually, that will be able to tell you how strong the fit is. For us though, all we can kind of do is do it very informally. So let's take a look at exercise number 2. Rank the strength of each best fit line below as none weak, moderate, or strong, and there will be one of each. All right. So really, you're almost kind of ranking these as what's the worst fit and what's the best fit kind of thing. So go ahead and do that. In each one of these blanks, write down either none, weak, moderate, or strong, and then we'll talk about them. All right, well, the one where the data is absolutely the closest to the line, right, and that's the key. Like, if the line has a strong fit to the data, right, then the data will be close to the line is right here, right? So this would be a strong fit, all right? And the one where the data is just sort of scattershot, there's just, there's no real positive or negative correlation whatsoever is right here. There is just no association between the data here, right? I mean, I could have drawn just about any line of best fit I wanted through here. There's really none here, right? So this is now the two categories that are a little bit trickier, the moderate and the weak. But if you look at letter D and you look at letter A, it's certainly true that the data is closer to the line of best fit in D and farther away in A. So here, I would call this a weak fit, and I'd call this one a moderate fit. Again, in isolation, if you just had a scatter plot in isolation like we did in exercise one, it is actually quite difficult to discern between a weak and a moderate fit, all right? Now again, there's no way in that last problem we should have called that a strong fit or no fit at all, but the difference between weak and moderate is a little bit challenging if you don't have anything else to compare it to, okay. So let's keep talking about these things. Exercise number three. The scatter plot below shows the association between two variables. Which of the following would be the most accurate way of describing this relationship? Okay, awesome. So what I'd like you to do is look at your four choices. One of those should be more or less on the mark with this scatter plot. All right, well, one of the best things to do in a situation like this is to try to draw a line of best fit because that'll help you kind of gauge, you know, what kind of fit you've got. Now, if I just kind of eyeball a line of best fit, it's roughly like that. Now, the first thing I notice about this association is it's definitely a negative association, meaning that as X goes up, Y goes down. So it's a negative association, which means it's not number one, and it's not number three. So the question now is would I rate this as a strong negative association or a moderate negative association? And for me, the data is just too far away from the line of best fit to say that it's a strong association. I'm gonna go with a moderate one, all right? A strong association, right, really that data should be very close to the line of best fit. It doesn't have to be an exact line, but it should be close. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. Now, lines of best fit are sometimes used for predictive purposes, and the strength of the fit is important because it tells us how reliable our predictions are, right? So, I mean, if the data lies very, very close to the line, then using the line to do a prediction means that the prediction is probably pretty reliable, like, i.e., that that really might happen in the real world. On the other hand, if the, if the fit is very weak, well, then you can't really trust your prediction. So let's take a look at one final exercise where we, where we kind of gauge that. Exercise number four. Kirk decided to do his science fair project on the association between the length of a person's foot 
and how well they do on a 50-question math quiz. He measures the length of the right foot of 100 subjects in centimeters and then has them take the quiz. The results are shown below. Letter A. What would the linear model predict for the number of questions answered correctly if the person has a right foot that is 25 centimeters in length? All right. Well, here's our model. Right, let me actually write that a bit bigger here. Y equals 0.45x plus 20. Why don't you go ahead with that model and predict how many questions a person would get right if their foot was 25 centimeters in length. All right, well, it's simple enough, right? That's the x value, right? The length of a person's right foot is the x value. So I'm just going to put this into my equation, 0.45 times 25 plus 20. Now remember, this is a quiz where we're just kind of answering questions. Um, so 0.45 times 20. Whoops, nope, sorry. Let me do 0.45 times 25 plus 20. That gives me 31.25. But I'm going to write down 31 because we are talking about how many of these questions they get correct. So we'll just assume it's got to be a whole number. So I'm going to round to 31. Okay, now let's talk about how strong the fit is. Letter B. How would you rank the fit of the model? Weak, moderate, or strong? Well, how would you rate it? Pause the video now and circle one of these three choices. All right, well, I would, I would go weak, right? I mean, there's definitely some kind of an association. It definitely kind of appears that as a person's foot length is getting longer, generally they're doing better on this quiz. But it is all over the place, right? You've got some people who do quite well on the quiz even though their foot length is, is pretty small. You've got other people who do pretty poorly on the quiz even though their foot length is quite large. So, you know, it's, it's weak. It's certainly not strong. And I wouldn't even go moderate on this. All right. Now, what's the point? Well, take a look at letter C. If Kirk uses his model to predict the number of questions a person would get correct on his quiz based on right foot length, how reliable would his prediction be? Explain. And again, the idea is, if I was trying to predict the y value of these data points based on their x value using this equation, how, how reliable is that, right? Well, write down something in C, and then let's talk about it. Well, I'm going to say not very reliable. Okay, or not, yeah, I'm just going to say not very reliable. Not very reliable because it is a weak Now again, like before we go on to letter D, right, let's talk about that like letter A, right, where we have a person who's 25 centimeters in length. You know, if I went to 25 here, I would see, right, like the prediction of the model is up here, right, 31. And yet at 25, I get people down here, right, I've got people up here. So really the, you know, saying, well, I, I can now take you, measure your foot, and predict how many questions you're going to get right on this, this math test, that's not going to be reliable at all. You know, I might give this, this to a person who's got a 25 centimeter long foot, and they might get all 50 of them right, or they might get only 10 of them right, right? Like that 31 is kind of a shot in the dark, right? Yes, it comes from my model, but because my model is weak, it is not a reliable prediction. Now let's take a look at one final issue with this particular scatter plot, which is kind of cool. Letter D. Why do you think there is a gap in the data set between 0 and 10 centimeters in foot length? And what I mean by that is, like, like there's, no, there's no data in there, right? Why do you think Kirk couldn't get any data for people in that 0 to 10 centimeter uh, length in their foot? Pause the video now.
Well, in all likelihood, it's because people with foot lengths in this 0 to 10 centimeter range are simply too young to take this math test. Right? I mean, 10 centimeters is only approximately 4 inches. That's a foot length that's that big. Right? That, that's the foot length of somebody who's a baby to maybe like, I don't know, 4 years old at most, right? So probably, you know, likely people with foot lengths this short were too young to take this math quiz. And really, if you think about age versus foot length, age versus foot length, that might explain why we see some kind of an association at all, right? The older a person is, you know, the, the longer their feet are, and therefore the more math they've had and the better they can do on this quiz. But again, it's a very weak association. And yet, we have no data in here because you're not going to go to a two-year-old and say, take this math quiz. And if you do, that person is probably going to get a zero on the quiz, right? So we don't include that data at all. All right. Now, today what we looked at was the strength of a linear fit. And the strength of a linear fit is basically just a measurement or even just a qualitative kind of like discussion of how closely the data is to the line of best fit. If the data is very close to the line of best fit, we call it a strong linear fit. And if the data is far away from the line of best fit, we likely will call it a weak fit to no fit at all. Now, the reason that the strength of a linear fit is so important is because the stronger the fit, the better the equation is at predicting outcomes. And we want that. You know, we want to be able to predict things in the real world. We want to be able to predict when a bridge will fall down. I'd love to be able to predict the, the price of a, of a stock, right, you know, three days from now. If I've got a linear fit that's really strong, then I can rely on the prediction that it gives me. And if the fit is very weak, I really can't. All right. Well, you're going to work a lot more with the strength of linear fits in Algebra 1. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 8 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.